Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. Want to improve your organization's customer service? Looking for insider tips to knock your customer socks off? Then you're in the right place. Here's your host, Yannick Grant. Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. On today's episode, our guest is Mark Baldino. Mark is a design industry expert with over 20 years in UX and human-centered design. He's a co-founder of Fuzzy Math, an award-winning UX design and innovation consultancy located in Chicago with clients worldwide. Along with building and sustaining a 20-person design studio, he's helped build and train UX teams for some of the largest companies in the world. Fuzzy Math's call to action, do good work, be good people, is embedded in all of Mark's work as he advocates for goodness in design, producing work we are proud of as designers and that positively impacts the lives of those who use digital products and services every day. Mark has led projects across complex and regulated industries, including Allstate, Hyatt Hotels, Microsoft, and GE Healthcare. So without further delay, plug your earphones in, sit back, and let's jump right into this wonderful conversation with Mark. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So, Mark, could you share a little bit about what, um, I mean, I know your bio said that you're a UX and human-centered design organization, um, Fuzzy Math. Could you maybe share with us? I think when I heard the name first, until I actually read what the company was about, I thought you were like some mathematical um, organization. But maybe give us um, some background behind why you decided to name the company that and just how you got into what you're doing today. Uh, well, well, thanks. Yes, it is a it's a unique name. It served us well for the past eleven and a half years. Yeah, the term fuzzy math it does mean something in the real world. For us, it speaks about the duality of the work that we do um, in the user experience and human centered design processes. So, kind of the fuzzy part is we're working with humans and we're trying to understand them, and they are complicated and complex, and sometimes they say one thing and and do another. So it can be hard to design products and services to to meet their needs. And the way we do that is kind of the math side, which is a little bit more of the robust process we follow, um, sort of a thorough user-centered design process we lead our clients through. And it kind of makes sense of, of, of what humans are saying and doing and allows us to build products that that better meet their needs. So it's kind of the analytics and process side, which is the math, solving for the the human psychology and, and fuzzy side, which is the is the humans. Mm, very cool. All right. So customer experience, user experience, user design, you know, those words sometimes are used interchangeably in navigating um, different experiences for customers across different industries. Could you share with us what is so different about what you guys do that really helps to enhance the customer's experience? Well, our process is about putting customers or users at the center of everything we do. So, you know, one of the reasons we use the term user um, is because it's it really focuses in on their use of a specific, in, in our case, we're designing a lot of web-based applications or mobile applications. Um, customer can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And and so you're thinking about customers from the brand perspective, from a marketing perspective, business perspective. And we try to get a little bit more narrow and think about, you know, who is this human sitting in front of a computer and and what are they doing every day? And how do we make their experience more efficient and effective and, and satisfying for them? And that doesn't always take into, you know, account the brand, for example, which mm-hmm. I think, again, brand and customer get aligned uh, a lot. And we try to break that out. We don't think in terms of in terms of brands. If, if we're working for a company that is a brand, we're really thinking about what is what is this person's um, experience with your product and with your and with your service, and how can we re architect it to better meet their needs? And so it's really about putting a user at the center of, of everything that we do and, and, and advocating for them and their needs. And that sometimes pushes against what might make the most sense from like a sales or a marketing perspective. And that's okay. There can be a natural tension between those. But for, for our purposes, it's let's give users a voice at the table here and advocate for, for their needs, which might push against some other considerations of, of a business. So it's kind of a, I'll say it's a slightly more narrow lens to focus in on mm-hmm. and really say who is this human being that that again is sitting in front of a computer 
has to use this digital product and 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 service and and how can we make them happier people while they're using these products right now we still have a lot of companies globally who i mean i think in light of covid customer experience has definitely been brought to the forefront even more now even companies who didn't used to focus on that Let's say, for example, you know, you're looking at your strategy for 2021 coming out of this year that we've all had that has been extremely different from any other year we've all experienced. Um, how, how would you demonstrate or justify the return on investment of focusing on UX? Why is it important? How does it how is it really going to transform your business? Why should you give attention to it as you would give attention to any other budgeted budgeted item um, for your business plan? Well, I would think that the year that everyone's just had um, <laughs> really really gives them a sense of why they should be investing in in digital. So you can take um, healthcare uh, for example, but you could say the same for some. Um, retail that's brick and mortar, um, maybe uh, higher education. So healthcare and higher education, you know, they have two things in common, which is they have these um, large, vast physical um, spaces that they've invested, you know, billions of dollars in. Right? A hospital in 2020 um, looks nothing like a hospital did in 2000 or in, in 1980. Um, mm-hmm. They are gorgeous structures. They look more like hotels, right? Right. And and so. The idea is when you step in, that experience that you get when you enter the atrium of a modern hospital is supposed to give you a sense of what's going to happen behind the behind the scenes, behind the behind the doors, right? It is this uh, amazing high tech, a uh, high touch. Um, again, it almost feels like you're stepping into a luxury hotel, and that's how you want to be treated. Well, guess how many people were using the, those front doors during COVID? No one. I mean, hospitals were busy, but they were not coming through the front doors and stepping in and getting a sense of this is where I want to spend money. It was much more from an emergency perspective. And instead, the digital front door of hospitals became the center point. Mm -hmm. And hospitals that had invested in 2019 and previously in their digital front door were um, much, much easier, much better positioned to to handle um, kind of customer service user experience, patient services, provide those in a much more effective and, and, and meaningful um, manner. And so if you invested in 2019 or, 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 or before, you know, let's say that that dollar you spent in 2019 was worth, I don't know, 10, 10 times as much in, in 2020. And, and nothing's to say it's not going to be just as valuable moving forward. So the idea is that people are, are, are experiencing um, brands and, and, and products, or I'll just say services overall, they're experiencing digital f- first or have experienced it digital first. Right. And a lot of people are, are digital, you know, they live digitally. They think that that's a normal thing, but you have to think of these uh, industries where there was a physical component to it and they had invested in that physical component. And now, you know, you're not taking a college tour and, and, and deciding on a college based on how fancy the building is. You're probably making that based on what they're what they're, you know, the digital experience you're going to get and whether you can tell that they've actually invested in, in that, in that digital experience. So mm-hmm. I, you know, even though I think we saw, um, a lot of budgets get tightened in 2020, given un- uncertainty, what we've seen in this quarter and what we're, we're expecting to continue to see in Q1 is that those budgets are getting reoriented towards kind of the digital experience. And so I I actually think it's kind of an easy sell. It's not one that I have to make, but I think for people internally is to say, if we haven't invested in our digital infrastructure, now is the time if we want this business to be sustainable. We can also have to shift maybe our organization overall towards spending more on these digital um, first experiences and not maybe spend as much in in something like physical uh, infrastructure. Agreed. Agreed. Great. So that definitely will allow people to have greater justification for why they need to make this type of investment and, of course, how it will impact their business in the long term. Um, Now, let's say, for example, we have a business and they're looking to go into this. How do you think, what are maybe one or two ways that you think you could probably suggest to them that they could be able to better manage their digital spend in the age of COVID? Because I think a lot of people feel like they're in contracting mode, that they need to not, you know, I've I've heard listened to many podcast interviews and I know a lot of organizations that would have done a year in planning in terms of what they're going to invest into. They're now doing shorter term plans, like three months, six months, because they just don't know yeah. what to expect. So with that in mind, maybe could you share with us one or two things that a company should take into consideration in managing their digital spend in the age of COVID? 
I think they need to think short and long term. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're too if you're too narrow in your focus of this uh, few months, I mean, I've heard I've heard that as well. Hey, we we have two months to make impact. You can only do so much in in two months, mm-hmm. and so. What we're helping a lot of our clients with is um, put roadmaps in place, which allow for um, a strategic view, which is uh, three years out. Um, even if there's a, a, a you know a large amount of uncertainty in in said industry, um, but that has a really tactical. Um, we're doing two to three month chunks of, of of work. So what can we accomplish in in a short term that's going to move um, the needles? Um, and some KPIs, but what is our vision for the for the longer term? Um, and and inside of that, um, it's something that you know we don't do a lot of like crisis management for our clients, but all of our clients went and frankly all human beings went through a crisis this past year. And um, I don't mean to say that we're going to experience another one, but there's there's nothing to say that this couldn't happen again in in two years to, down the road. So True. while you're thinking strategically long term, while you're solving stuff in the short term. You you need to invest in an infrastructure that's going to allow you to pivot quickly during a point of crisis. I mean, again, I hate to go back to the healthcare example, um, but it's an easy one these days. A lot of uh, websites and customer service teams were on un, un, were very unprepared for the deluge of of visitors. In some cases, I heard you know three thousand percent increase in in web traffic. So that's like an is the technical architecture going to support that? But can we respond to that many requests? Mm-hmm. And so this isn't just shouldn't be a pulse that is a blip on the radar for 2020. People need to invest in crisis management and how they can respond and how their digital products and services respond during, um, you know, a, a crisis like this. So I think, you know, w- w- again, we're trying to map out what the long term improvements to customer experiences are over a three year period. We're trying to help our clients adjust and make some changes incrementally along the way that are going to move the needle in a two or three month time frame and start to think about what it looks like when a, when a crisis hits again and, and how teams respond and how technology responds and how we can utilize technology to respond during those points of crisis. Amazing. All right. Thank you for sharing, Mark. Okay, Mark, could you share with us, how do you stay motivated every day? Well, this is a good, well I mean, fear is a big motivator, right? Just to be quite, quite honest, I think <laughs> um, in 2020, it's, you know, it is this sense of, you know, um, uh, fight or flight. Um, you need to keep the business going. That's not a great long-term motivator because it just wears you down a little bit. Um, uh, so I try to I try to spend time away from from my computer, and that keeps me motivated to get back to the computer. Um, I work a lot with my hands, uh, crafts, uh, furniture building, uh, light construction. Um, that's really uh, it's a lot less cerebral, um, and it's a lot more physical. And I find that when I'm able to um, step away from the computer and and start to work on physical products or physical projects, um, I, I yearn to be back in front of the computer because there's something about the amount of, of, of change you can influence or impact through the work that we do as, as designers. Um, and that's really, really powerful. And it's not just about me and a, a closet I'm building or a piece of furniture, like that's personally re- rewarding for me and I, and I enjoy that. Um, but, you know, a lot of the products we work on are with bigger businesses and and thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people are using these tools every day. And there's a lot of power in being able to make those tools um, uh, more satisfactory and joyful for, for humans. And mm-hmm. so there's kind of this exponential um, push um, that we can make in people's lives through the tools that we redesign. Um, but sometimes when you're so focused on, you know, what's the next sale we're going to make? I do primarily sales at, at, at Fuzzy Math these days. I don't do a lot of design myself. Um, you sort of miss that larger picture. So to stay motivated, I get away from the computer. I go work in the in the, in the physical world. And then that really pulls me back to the computer because I can get um, just a different perspective on, on what it is we do at Fuzzy Math and, and how we're helping people. All right. So that's how you stay motivated. All right. Can you share with our listeners also, what's the one online resource, tool, website, or app that you absolutely can't live without in your business? I mean, it's, it's going to sound um, uh, standard, but, but email. Um, I mean, I'd love to say Slack. My team loves Slack as a digital tool. I think it's enabled the business to, to, to function better, specifically remotely. Um, but 
you know, as many times as people try to remake email and make that experience better, there's a reason we all use it. Um, it's, it's very easy. Uh, it's quick to communicate with people. And so, uh, it's a boring answer, but it's, it's where I'm at almost every minute of every day is in my inbox Mm -hmm. and I use it as a way to manage tasks and to do's. Um, I'm kind of a zero inbox person. Um, I have a number of ways and filters to to clean my inbox um, and make it an efficient mechanism for me. But I've been using it for since you know AOL, so we're we're early '90s. Um, I've been using email for a while. I'm very comfortable with it, and I can be a creature of habit sometimes. Uh, and it takes a while for me to shift into into something else. So as boring as it sounds, I feel like email is consistent, and for me, it's something I can always rely on as a tool to know. What's what's coming into my business? What's going out of my business? And and what do I need to do every day? Um, so maybe not the most inspiring answer, but it's <laughs> it's an it's an honest one. I can't. I mean, I, if you ask me what I can't live without, it's it's at this point it's, it's email. It's, definitely, definitely. Don't don't feel um bad about sharing email because <laughs> it's important and it's a it's an excellent communication tool, and it does it does definitely allow for some level of um accountability paper trail you know to you can go back in i mean i've pulled up emails that i've sent to people from three four five years ago just to make reference to maybe a conversation that was had that sure. maybe you know you just need to um bring back to the forefront based on what you're moving on with for you know currently so it really really is an excellent resource so i'm not going to negate your application <laughs> all right mark could you share with us maybe one or two books that have had the biggest impact on you maybe a book that you've read recently or a book you read a very long time ago but it definitely had a great impact on you um so there's there's two books um that have probably had the um uh biggest um impact on me the first is uh, managing a professional services firm by david meister it's an old it's an old book um i think i think 90s i mean i guess that's not that old but um has been updated a number of times it basically gave me all of the tools um to build a professional services firm and how to think about my team and myself and leadership structure and consulting in general um, you know, a lot of consultants started as practitioners. I did. And then they build consultancies because, you know, there's work out there. But running a business is very different from from doing design work. And so managing a professional services firm, I, I call it, you know, my Bible in terms of if I have a question, I, I go there um, uh, first. Uh, I, I spent a few months in Argentina um, last year during the winter to escape an awful Chicago winter. And I read... <laughs> I read Let My People Go um, Surfing, uh, which is by the founder of Patagonia. And that was just a fantastic book. It's it's part bio, which is just great to understand, um, you know, how and why Patagonia was um, was founded. But it, but it was also there's a business uh, component to it and how you can run a kind of an ethical business and what you can look out for and how you can guide your company. And, you know, I'm a firm believer in like the ethos and values that Patagonia um, uh, you know, sort of imbues in its in its products and services. But there's a real honesty to the book in terms of, you know, in a perfect world, no one needed more clothes, and Patagonia would go out of would go out of business, and they don't hide from that fact. You know, they sort of they sort of explain it, and so I just found it a really refreshing read. And I think people that people that like that book, um, I think, are people that I would kind of enjoy in the in the real world to talk to. So it's it's been kind of a a book that. That I keep an eye or an ear out for um, if people have have read it because I think that if they read it and enjoyed it and found value in it, they probably have a similar set of values to me, and and those can be some of the the best well, friends first of all, but you know kind of professional relationships when there's a, a bit of a value overlap. All right, sounds good. So we will have the links to those books in the show notes of this episode, so our listeners can definitely tap into that great content that you've shared with us. All right, Mark. Can you share with us what's the one thing that's going on in your life right now that you're really excited about? It could be something that you're working on to develop yourself or something you're working on to develop your people. We, the, it's internally and it's about developing our, our people. We've started a, um, a DEI, diversity, equity and inclusivity initiative at Fuzzy Math. It's about 18 months old. Um, and uh, that's by far been the most rewarding part of, of, of 2020 because we made a lot of progress there. Um, the initiative was not started because we had a crisis of 
diversity, equity, and inclusivity mm -hmm. on the team. It was because people thought that there was room that we could grow as a, as a firm, even as a, a team of, of 20. And so two employees came to us and said, hey, we think we should invest time and energy into this, that there's some room for growth here. And Ben is my business partner and I said, okay, what's kind of what's the plan? Help us along here. We eventually brought in a third party consultant um, who's been a tremendous resource for us. And, um, you know, it's really reoriented how I think about growth at the company and proper growth um, and our our role potentially in um, equity and, and inequality in, in the design industry, um, how we hire people and retain them, how we can maybe train people who don't have a formal background in in what we do, how we can create apprentice and internship internship programs. And we've been doing all of this, but we haven't done it with a lens of DEI. And um, obviously this past year, there's been, you know, worldwide attention, um, specifically through through Black Lives Matter, um, and we were we started the process ahead of that, but you know, it really it dovetailed well as that there was a, a specific focus on it, um, you know, globally and and certainly in the United States, and for us to have um, a forum for our team to communicate about their concerns. And then be able to plan for what the future looks like. So we have a two-year roadmap for how we're going to improve um, DEI at Fuzzy Math, and um, it's not just a one-stop shop. We didn't just write a you know DEI statement and, and put it on our website. In fact, it's not on the website um, yet because we're taking a very thorough um, kind of um, methodic approach to this. And it's a long-term change of the composition of the people at Fuzzy Math and their backgrounds, um, how you can have a voice at Fuzzy Math, um, what um, hiring retention. Uh, growth and career paths. A lot of things I didn't put in the DEI bucket. Um, my team did because um, they felt that they were important in terms of communication from the founders down to the team. So it's been a tremendous learning experience for me. It's been great to see because it's been um, it's been team led. Like my team has driven this, and that's that's super rewarding as a business owner to to see people care so much about about the company and more specifically about each other uh, to want to invest time and energy into DEI. All right, sounds good. Okay, so we will definitely be following that journey eventually when it becomes public and you know you may serve as a benchmark for other organizations that may want to take on that same kind of initiative um can you tell our listeners where they can find you online if they really want to connect with you more maybe they are thinking of um, understanding a little bit more about fuzzy math they may want to engage with your services at fuzzy math or maybe they just want to um check you out where can they find you online yeah, so Sure. So everything's at, at fuzzymath.com, um, which is our website. If you go to the resources section, there's a newsletter. I encourage people to sign up for the newsletter. Um, we don't spam you. We send out one um, new sort of newsletter every month, which includes a topic of our interest. Sometimes it's it's very specific to design and designers. Um, recently, it's been about kind of the business value of design and ROI of design. Um, and then we include some links and articles that 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 we have read in the past month that we enjoy. We have the benefit of living and breathing UX every single day, and, and not everyone has that. So we try to pull some resources together for people. Um, if people want to you know, reach out to me, my, my email is Mark at Fuzzy Math. Um, I'm happy to answer emails, chat, schedule some time to connect, whether it's about you know, starting a career in design or you know, whether you have a potential project um, that we could help you out with. But everything's through fuzzymath.com. All right. Sounds good. All right, Mark, before we wrap our interviews up, we always like to ask our guests, do you have a quote or a saying that during times of adversity or challenge, you'll tend to revert to this quote? It kind of helps to get you back on track or just keep you focused. Do you have one of those? Um, you know, I don't really have a quote. I, there's just this sort of, um, you know, uh, saying, and I, I don't know where it's attributed to. It's around, you know, do you have a strategic plan. Yes, it's it's called doing things. Uh, I think people sometimes worry too much about strategy and less about execution. And uh, I've tried to make my career um, about kind of execution and, and doing. I, I consider myself a bit of a, a doer. So, um, you know, it helps me re when I'm thinking about like, where's fuzzy math going to be in five years or 10 years? People sometimes ask that question. And I don't always have a clear picture. I just have to remind myself that we just have to continue doing what we've been doing for 11 and a half years. It's made a successful bunch of happy clients and, and happy users along the way. So um, if you're ever concerned about what to do next, just just do start creating, start building. Um, you know, don't spend too much time thinking or, or planning because execution, um, you know, is all that matters at the end of the day. All right. Sounds good. Just do. All right. <laughs> 
Okay, Mark, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule today to just hop on this podcast and share all of these great nuggets as it relates to UX and ensuring that, you know, you have a good design in place and that you put, you know, as you said, you execute and that you have a team that's motivated and completely dedicated to the processes of ensuring that your clients leave feeling really amazing and fantastic. Of course, that will definitely motivate them to want to come back and do business with you again. So I just wanted to extend um, our greatest um, appreciation for you to jump on here with us today fantastic well i appreciate your time and having me on and for having me on the podcast all right guys just want to remind you you can join our private facebook group it's navigating the customer experience community and feel free to follow us on twitter at navigating cx until next time i'm your host yenny grant Thank you for listening to Navigating the Customer Experience. If you'd like to connect with us even more, please feel free to hop onto Facebook and join our private Facebook group, Navigating the Customer Experience Community. And of course, feel free to follow us on Twitter at NavigatingCX. We also have a new book available on Amazon, The ABCs of a Fantastic Customer Experience. It's available in ebook and paperback. So if you want to increase revenue in your organization, build a stronger service culture, and create employees or develop employees who are really mastering service delivery in your business, you need to grab a copy of this book. Until next time, I'm your host, Yannick Grant. Thanks for listening. For more awesome resources to take your customer service game to another level, head over to navigatingthecustomerexperience.com. See you next time.